The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Once on a Golden Afternoon, starring Tom Conway and Natalie Wood. Maureen O'Sullivan is your hostess. More things are wrought by prayer than this world's dreams are. One of the great joys we as parents have is to see our children growing up in the knowledge and love of God. Yes, and maybe growing up with them is the way to keep young always, for certainly their faith and trust in God is always an inspiration to our own faith. You know, children have a wonderful way of knowing that God is always close to them and that he can and will hear their prayers. So often it happens that we lose much of the happiness of life because we forget the simplicity of childhood, the direct, simple way children have for love and laughter. Yes, and insight into the happiness of children, how we can add to their enjoyment and lightheartedness, is a way to recapture the joy that, as adults, we often lose. Love of God and daily family prayer in our homes gives lighthearted happiness and peace and harmony because praying together as a family brings God close to all of us. Tonight is a special program. Family Theatre presents a story for children for all children from 6 to 65. A story that happened once on a golden afternoon, starring Tom Conway and Natalie Wood. Maureen O'Sullivan will return after tonight's family theater story, Once on a Golden Afternoon, starring Natalie Wood and Tom Conway. In the lounge of the press club in Washington, D.C., the annual banquet of the press club has drawn foreign correspondents from the four corners of the globe, editors from the nation's newspapers, and, of course, reporters of every description. The President of the United States is the guest of honor. People keep milling in and out, but in the far corner of the vast lounge sit two men, oblivious to the noise and excitement. Edward Kent, roving foreign correspondent for International Syndicate, and Jim Thorne, Washington correspondent for the Time Sentinel News. Ah, uh, Kent, this is really old home week for me. You know, I haven't seen you since, oh, let me see, before the war. Yeah, and a few years before that, 1937 to be exact. Yes, that's right, the London Economic Conference. We covered it together. <laughs> you covered it, Jim. I didn't. I got fired. Say, uh, what happened then? Somebody told me that you got fed up with the way things were happening in the world and wanted to get away from it all. No, I ran into something better than the economic conference. At least I thought it was. Mm-hmm. What was that? The story on Alice Liddell. Liddell? Was that the Whitechapel prisoner? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, this was... This was an 80-year-old, rosy-cheeked little lady who oh. lived in the flat below me. Mm-hmm. I got fired when I missed the most important meeting of the conference because I waited to hear the story she told me about a... a golden afternoon. Yeah? It's a story known to everyone, but it actually happened to her, and the remembrance gave her the wonderment and simplicity of a child. You see, as a little girl, she lived near Christ College in Oxford. This was in 1864. And there was a young professor who taught mathematics at the college, and... Well, one day he'd promised to take the two Liddell girls, Edith and Alice, on a picnic. And they were waiting for him near the river. Hello there. How is everyone on this glorious afternoon? Well, aren't we on speaking terms? Edith is angry. Angry? At whom? At you, Mr. Dodgson. Oh, I see. And you, Alice, are you angry too? Well, if I have to tell you that we're angry, then I can't be angry if I speak to you, can I? No. No, you can't. Because when you speak to a person at whom you're angry, then you're no longer angry. She is 
too. I am not. I say, what is this all about? Well, didn't you forget something? Now, let me see. You promised to take us on a picnic. Oh, good heavens, I did forget. Now, you wait here. I'll dash up to my room and get the picnic basket. We'll have it filled up, and we'll be rowing down the river in no time. I know just the spot for <laughs> That's the story of Fair Rosamond. And over there, near the old monastery, is her burial place. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Tell us another before we land, Mr. Dodger. Why, I've almost run out of stories. Oh, that bridge yonder has a little story. It's been here ever since the time of the Romans. And that is how Oxford got its present name. It was a floor for oxen to pass over. And... So long before the Christian era, it was called Oxenford. Oh! Well, here we are. Isn't this a perfect place for a picnic? Oh, I love it here. I'll take the picnic basket. Alice, you the blanket, and you, Edith. Well, let me see. Will you chaperone the landing of the troops? Ready? Prima, Secunda, Tertia. Forward! What's this? Mutiny? I say forward and none of you move. But you said Prima, uh, Secunda, and Tertia, and they aren't here. <laughs> Edith is Prima, that's the first contingent. And you, Alice, are Secunda, that is the second. And I am Tertia. Which is the third? Right. And now let's be off to that shady tree out of the sun. <laughs> So, an apple for each of you, and we've cleaned the picnic basket. There you are, Edith. And here's one for Alice. Catch it. Hurry, it's rolling down to the river. Oh, it disappeared down that hole. It'll take a longer hand than yours to reach it. I'm afraid we've lost it. You see, it's a rabbit hole, and it goes down deep. What does the rabbit do down there? Does he live down there all the time? Of course not. He has to get air. He comes out and uh, eats shrubs. Oh, and... look. There he is over in the bushes. He's a white rabbit. Catch him, Alice. Catch him. Oh, you can't now. He's gone down the hole again. Oh, he was such a pretty rabbit. Why does he want to go down that old dirty hole? Oh, but it isn't an old dirty hole. It's, uh... It's rather a wonderful place down there. You see... Up here, the world is sometimes filled with things that are hard and cruel, and people who are sometimes thoughtless and unkind and selfish. You mean like the jealous queen who killed Fair Rosamond? Yes. But down there is a wonderland with mock turtles and lorries and griffins. Oh, tell us about it. We'd like to go down there. Well, uh, well, you see, there's quite a story about this wonderland. Story? Please tell us, is it about the white rabbit? And mock turtles? Yes. And about a little girl who followed the white rabbit down into the hole. And suddenly, she found herself dropping. Down, down, down. And... While she was falling, she was clutching at things on the way, saying, Oh! 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 Well, after such a fall as this, I'll think nothing of tumbling downstairs. I wonder how many miles I've fallen. I'm up here somewhere near the center of the earth, I'm sure. Oh, oh, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, the Duchess, the Duchess. Uh, won't she be savage if I kept her waiting? If you please, sir. Master Rabbit. Oh, 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 oh. oh. my fur and whiskers. Where are my gloves and pants? I'll have to be on my head. Dear, dear, how queer everything is down here. I wonder if I've been changed. Now, the same, the next question is, who in the world am I? Well, if 
I'm really Alice and Adele. I'll remember my little poem. Now, let's see. How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail and pour the waters of the Nile on every golden scale? How cheerfully he seems to grin. How neatly spread his claws. And welcome little fishes in with gentle, smiling jaws. I'm sure those are not the right words. I must be somebody else after all. And I shall have to live in this pokey little hole and have no toys to play with. Oh! Hello, Mr. Mouse. That's the cat. What? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I quite forgot you didn't like cats. We won't talk about that any longer. As if I would talk on such a subject. Our family always hated cats. Nasty, low, vulgar things. Don't let me hear the name again. Mouse dear, do come back. And we won't talk about cats anymore. Very well. You know, you promised to tell me your history. Why do you hate C-A-T-S? Oh, yes. Mine is a long and sad tale. It certainly is a long tale. But why do you call it sad? Silly girl, what are you talking about? Your tail. Oh, look! Look at all those funny things near the pool. Funny? What is so funny about a dodo and a larvae and a caterpillar? Oh, I know what a caterpillar is. But what is he doing over there? Smoking his pipe. That's a funny thing. And he's sitting on top of a mushroom. That's why not. Oh, I'm sure I don't know. But he has large, lonely eyes. I know he must be very unhappy. Who can tell? Who can tell? I'll go and talk to him. <laughs> Caterpillar. Who are you? I hardly know, sir. Explain yourself. I can't, sir, because I'm not myself, you see. I don't see. Well, I'm afraid it's very confusing. It isn't. Maybe not to you, but I'll go away if you don't want to be friendly. Come back. I have something important to say. What, sir? Keep your temper. What? Keep your temper. Is that all you have to say? No, but that's most important. Oh. So you think you've changed, do you? I'm afraid I have, sir. I keep growing and shrinking, and I'm not the same size for ten minutes. And I can't remember things. Can't remember what things? I tried to say, how does the busy bee? But it came out different. Oh. Then recite. You are old, Father William. All right, I'll try. You are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white. And yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain. But now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turn the back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason for that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his gray locks, I kept all my limbs very supple. By the use of this ointment, one shilling a box. Allow me to sell you a couple. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak. For anything tougher than suet. Yet you finish the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how you manage to do it? In my youth, that his father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife. And the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lost it the rest of my life. You're too old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eyes were as steady as ever. Yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions, and that is enough. Said his father, don't give yourself airs. Do you think I could listen all day to such stuff? Be up, or I'll kick you downstairs. Kick him downstairs? 
I am ashamed of you. It is not said right. Not quite right, I'm afraid, sir. It's wrong from beginning to end. That's because I've become so small. You're quite big enough. Oh, but three inches is a wretched height to be. It's a very good height indeed. I'm almost three inches. But I'm not used to it. But you will be in time. One side will make you taller, and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? Of the muscle room, of course. You mean eat it? Of course. Oh, here he comes. Here he comes. I must be away. <laughs> oh, my dear paws. Oh, my fur and whiskers. She'll get me executed. Is she a spirit to ferret? Oh, Mr. Rabbit! Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Wait, Mr. Rabbit. Where are you going? Don't leave me here alone. Oh, Mr. Rabbit. Now I know I must be lost. If I were only home again, I'd love everybody so much more. Oh. Oh. Dear Farley, what? Who are you? I'm the Cheshire Cat. The Cheshire Cat? What are you grinning at? I am mad. Oh. And you're mad. We're all mad here. How do you know I'm mad? You must be or you wouldn't be here. Would you tell me then which way I ought to go? That depends on where you want to get. I don't much care where. Well, then it doesn't matter which way you go. Over that way lives the man Haddis, and the opposite way is the Marsh Hare. Damn ghost man! I've seen Haddis before, so I'll go to see... Oh, what are you doing? Vanishing. But you're beginning to vanish at the end of your tail. Yes, and I go up to my friend. Oh, you're all gone. All except my friend. Goodness. I've often seen a cat without a grin, but a grin without a cat. It's the most curious thing I ever saw in my life. He's mad. Where are you, man? Where did you see the mark May I come in? No room. No room. But I can see there's plenty of room. I'll just sit down at the table with you and the doorknob and the hatter. <laughs> I'm mad. The mad hatter. I have some milk. I don't see any milk. Uh, there isn't any. Then it wasn't very civil of you to offer it. It wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited. Your hair wants cutting. Personal remarks are very rude. Uh, then why is a raven like a writing desk? Oh, now we shall have some fun. I love riddles. You mean you can find out the answer? Exactly so. Then say what you mean. I do. At least, I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. You might as well say I get what I like is the same thing as I like what I get. Or I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. Have you guessed the riddle yet? No, I give up. What's the answer? I haven't the slightest idea. Nor I. You're just wasting time. What time is it? It's six o'clock. It's time to eat. I'm getting hungry. Have you seen the mock turtle yet? I don't even know what a mock turtle is. It's the thing mock turtle soup is made from. Are you hungry? I don't think. Then don't talk. It's time to go. Sit down and don't speak a word. Not a word? But you were going to tell your story. Not a word. Well, sir, I don't see how you can finish if you don't even begin. Once? Oh, oh. Once I was a real turtle. Uh, thank you, sir. That was a very interesting story. But, uh, oh, oh, I'm not finished. No? No. When we were little, though you mayn't believe it, we went to school in the sea. Oh! The master was an old turtle. We called him Tortoise. Why did you call him Tortoise if he wasn't one? You know, you really are very dull. We called him Tortoise because he taught us. Oh, but how many hours a day did you do your lessons? Ten the first day, 
Mind the next and so on. That was a curious plan. Well, that's why they're called lessons. Because they lessen from day to day. Oh, look. What is that? The lobster quadrille. They're going to dance? Why, of course. Form two lines. Advance twice. Change lobsters. Get that jellyfish out of the way. Now out to sea and don't be slow. Turn a somersault and there you go. It was a beautiful dance. Oh, here he comes again. My whiskers and fur, the Duchess. In the Duchess. She had me executed. He sure as carrots to carrots. Oh, Mr. Rabbit. Oh, dear, dear. What do you want? I'd like to see the Duchess. She's in a stew. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Wait, Mr. Rabbit. I'll go with you. Well, you don't know much, that's a fact. Oh, be careful, Duchess. You'll boil the pot over and we'll all be burned. If everybody minded their own business, the world would go round and eagle faster than it does. Which would not be an advantage. Why? Well, just think what it would do to the day and night. You see, the Earth takes 24 hours to turn on its axis. Speaking and... of axis, time to chop off her head. Oh, dear, oh, dear. You're hot-tempered, Duchess. Maybe it's the pepper that makes people hot-tempered. I can't tell just now what the moral of that is, but I'll remember it in a bit. Perhaps it hasn't one. Tut, tut, child. Everything's got a moral, if only you can find it. Everything's got a moral. Oh? There it is. Oh, tis love. Tis love that makes the world go round. Somebody said that it's done by everybody minding their own business. The moral of that is birds of a feather flock together. How fond you are of finding morals and things. Oh, yes. The moral of that is. Be what you would seem to be, or more simply said, never imagine yourself to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that you are or appear to be. But that isn't more simple. Chop off her head! Oh, dear, oh, dear. My fan and gloves. I knew it would happen. Mr. Rabbit, help me! Wait for me, please! <laughs> Wake up. What's the matter? The white rabbit is so unfriendly. Oh, we'll have to give him a good talking to the next time. Oh, but you didn't finish the story. I couldn't very well. In the middle of it, Edith went off to pick daisies and you went fast asleep. Then I must have dreamed about the mouse and the duchess and the turtle and the rabbit. Well, not exactly. I started telling you a story about them and... Oh, I remember. It was a wonderful story. A story just for you, Alice. And for Edith. Will you write it down so I can remember it always? Write it down? Yes. And I'll call it A Golden Afternoon. No. Call it Alice in Wonderland. Then it'll be just for me. Wouldn't you want it for all your friends, too? Oh, yes. For everybody. For all of us who are children, always. A story to remember the simple joys of childhood. And... The happy summer day. Well, that was the story Alice Pleasance Liddell told me. That's why I missed the meeting of the London Economic Conference and got fired. Uh, the original Alice in Wonderland? Well, uh... that's right. Later, Dodson asked a George MacDonald to draw pictures for little Alice Liddell's book. MacDonald showed the manuscript to Macmillan, the publisher, who decided the book should be published for the millions of Alices throughout the world. But I thought Lewis Carroll wrote Alice in Wonderland. 
Oh, that happened because Dodgson was a professor of mathematics at Oxford. Oh. He thought everyone would laugh if they knew he'd written that book. So he used his first and middle names twisted around. His first name, Charles, was made Carol, and his middle name, Ludwidge, became Lewis. Lewis Carroll. And what happened to little old rosy cheek lady? Well, she died a short time later. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to have seen the original book that he'd written for her, though. And inscribed on the cover was Lewis Carroll's last dedication. To the little girl who has been my inspiration, Alice Pleasant Slidell, by Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> You know, sometimes it's good to be able to daydream into a child's world of wonderment, where life's most beautiful lessons are learned. Most of us can recall at least one golden afternoon, an afternoon away from the world of reality that's often so thoughtless. If the world today needs anything, it's first a renewal of faith, a renewal of trust in God and in His eternal providence. If only all of us could get back to those simple truths, if only all homes would get back to the daily practice of family prayer, this indeed would be a better and a happier world. A world where there would be true brotherhood of all men and the lasting fatherhood of God. Let us tonight make this simple dedication of our families to God. Let us dedicate a short period every day to the practice of family prayer in our homes. For there is a joy and a happiness in daily family prayer, and there is this lasting assurance that the family that prays together stays together. Before saying goodnight, I'd like to thank Tom Conway and Natalie Wood for their performances this evening. Our thanks to John Slott and Emil Frank for writing tonight's play and to Max Terr for his music. This production of Family Theatre Incorporated was directed by David Young. Others who appeared in tonight's play were Virginia Gregg, Anne Whitfield, Dick Ryan, Fred Shields, Howard McNear, Earl Keane, and Cy Kendall. Next week, our Family Theatre stars will be Joan Loring and Louise Beavers in Fear is a Little Word. Your host will be Bob Crosby. This is Maureen O'Sullivan saying good night, and God bless you. This series of the Family Theatre broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program and by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need. Be with us next week at this same time when our Family Theatre stars will be Joan Loring and Louise Beavers with Bob Crosby as host. Tony Lafrano speaking. <laughs>